Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to my today's presentation on a case study on white etching cracks in bearings uh, related to oil changes. Um, I would like to show a brief presentation. Wait a second for, uh, let, let me share my screen. So there we are. Now you should be able to see it. So um, um, my agenda is quite simple today. Firstly, I would like to introduce the topic of white etching cracks a little bit, and then I will show um, yeah, the case study of, let's say, uh, the few cases that are somehow similar to each other. And then finally, uh, I would like to conclude. So firstly, what is... Um, uh, yeah, what is this topic on white edge and crack failures uh, uh, about? Uh, well, we face some bearings where we have premature failures and everything seems to be fine. The bearings are well dimensioned like this. We have sufficient lubrication. We have neither overheating nor contamination nor whatsoever that could possibly explain um, explain some uh, premature failures, but still somehow suddenly we see a race flip flicking in like in this case on a, uh, on the inner ring of a, a spherical roller bearing. And now the, and the question is why? How is this possible? How can this uh, how can this happen? Huh? And um, uh, yeah, the picture just looked a little bit like. Um, uh, like typical rolling contact fatigue on the first glance, but in the very beginning, I would like to um, yeah to show what are actually the differences yeah, and how you can possibly get the first feeling that um, something else is going on that we are not talking about rolling contact fatigue um, that we face some totally different issue. Therefore. Um, so let's uh, quickly go to uh, or discuss the failure or the damage mechanism of rolling contact fatigue. And um, according to the Hertz theory, um, we, uh, uh, we can calculate the stress distribution underneath the contact and in relation to the width of the contact between the roller and uh, the raceway or the ball and the raceway, we have the particular stress components. And accordingly, we have the maximum for Mises stress at a certain depth, which is characteristically defined by the width of uh, the contact. And as the maximum stress of the material uh, is at a certain depth, we normally, like in this case, uh, face the, uh, the first cracks um, yeah, yeah, underneath the surface, and the cracks will first propagate um, parallel to the surface until complete flakes leave the raceway. And this leads to very characteristic pattern. You can see this here. Now, these are some examples that we produced in our bearing test rig, where we have the, the advantage or where we are in the fortunate situation that we know very well what uh, what we are doing and we know very well what uh, what happened yeah? and this is basically if you, if you look at this uh, roller here, this is basically the, uh, the smallest kind of flaking the smallest uh, pitting that we can possibly have just because of this failure mechanism firstly the cracks propagate parallel to the surface nobody will notice them until a complete flake will just leave uh, the roller and what is interesting to see is that um, if let's say there's a, uh, the flaking will start at one position um, the propagation of the spalling is firstly in actual direction until the complete raceway would be utilized. Yeah? And then it will go further around the circumference. Yeah? It always looks that way unless there's a reason that explains that it looks differently, like in this case, for example. Here we can still see that this that the propagation is in actual direction, but apart from that, we have such groove over here. Yeah, and um, the reason for this one is that uh, actually the flakes yeah, uh, do not simply disappear. Um, and sometimes it can happen that such a flake will be stuck in the cage and then work as a cutting tool like in the turning machine. Uh, and uh, then certainly we have some guiding of the failure propagation around the circumference, but still from all these positions, the, propag the natural propagation is in this way. That, that's how it looks like on rollers. On rings, it looks similar. 
here not again because we have a different reason here we actually had some edge contact what you can see here the uh, the, the contact pattern was not uh, was not good yeah in this bearing so we see plastic deformation here we have the uh, the first spalling here still the propagation in actual direction but then the proper uh, pro uh, the failure uh, did stop it didn't yeah just simply because here in this area we do not really have stress yeah and if and without stress Certainly, um, there cannot be um, yeah, uh, damage. Yeah? Very simple. Yeah? In real applications, yeah, it looks very similar. This is very uh, characteristic. Other failures uh, that go along with raceway flaking yeah, can look uh, still in the first and similar, but um, but there's something different that we can see, and this is um, these uh, muscle-shaped cracks that we can uh, that we can see here. These are very characteristic for um, surface-initiated um, um, uh, failure, um, and uh, such will happen if um, um, if we have some failure of the lubrication film. Again, this is not typical rolling contact fatigue, but this is all neither white etching cracks. And white etching cracks, actually, we face cracks underneath the circum uh, sur on underneath the surface. Sorry, um, that do not follow any preferred direction or something you can see it like uh, here of uh, this uh, this curve basically looks very similar to some um uh, let's say if, uh, if the graph at the stock exchange and uh, so totally chaotic yeah uh, not following uh, not following the surface uh, or the raceway or something and uh, this indicates that something else happened and if we apply the etching yeah, and here we we applied nitric acid to our metallographic specimen then we can see all these white areas underneath the structure following around uh, uh, following these cracks or vice versa now yeah, you can see it here very well here again there's our graph from the stock exchange and obviously um, <clears throat> these uh, white etching areas um, did cause these cracks uh, these uh, they lead to some uh, enormous stress concentration and behave like enormous inclusions yeah that's that's uh, sim uh, yeah, basically so the, the, the summarize of uh, of this uh, uh, phenomenon of of the function of these white etching uh, etching areas yeah uh, the topic itself yeah is still a matter of research so it's it's not 100% understood so far nevertheless we basically know uh, that especially hydrogen hydrogen embrittlement can uh, uh, can be relevant and also electricity uh, these two um, yeah, uh, yeah, phenomena um, the, the most relevant drivers yeah, of this um, uh, of this structure alteration um, I uh, today we don't have the time to go further into details we have uh, just uh, today we have to be aware that there are two major uh, drivers of this um, uh, yeah, of this kind of uh, damage some people say it has something to do with let's say high loads or, or let's say excessive shock loads or something uh, which is at least partially true um uh, uh, it's just just very simple so uh, i don't actually think that uh, the shock loads or something will lead to uh, will, uh, will cause these white etching areas. But if we have these white etching areas leading to internal stress concentration, then any kind of shock loads will lead to cracks. So the crack appearance is basically something mechanical, um, while um, uh, the, uh, the structure alteration that, uh, that results in some internal stress concentration and results in some weakening of, uh, of the material is a different um, a different story. Yeah? And um, uh, certainly uh, the, the only way to really un uh, confirm that we talk about white etching cracks and the final identification can only be done by metallography, but we can just by visual inspection, we can have some very, very strong indication. For example, numerous crack origins. Um, this is uh, this basically means that the internal stress concentration in the material is more significant yeah, or more relevant uh, than the stress concentration by the crack itself, yeah, by, the, by, by the damage itself. Normally, in case of uh, rolling contact fatigue, we have one, two, maybe three uh, oranges of flaking. If we have multiple of them, this means something is wrong with the material. Can be 
yeah, uh, yeah, excessive amount of inclusions or um, a structural alter uh, alteration, which uh, mechanically um, are basically uh, have the same or they have the same mechanical consequences. Then the next would be the flaking not on the complete width, like in this case. Yeah, this is very characteristic. This means that somewhere here we have our white etching areas and here not. Actual cracks going along with pits. Yeah, again, this is something that we, what we will never see in pure rolling contact fatigue. And here we can see that uh, we basically have two patterns. So this looks very similar like rolling contact fatigue, but here these, these areas, yeah, and the, uh, these are firstly rather even, they look like typical brittle failure, which again uh, shall, let's say, ring the bell yeah, that we might possibly face some, some hydrogen embrittlement. And also uh, we can see that uh, here the cracks penetrated much deeper into, into the material, uh, uh, which, which is uh, very untypical for rolling contact fatigue uh, and therefore indicates that we have a different phenomenon involved. So, and this case, yeah, this is just uh, uh, the same picture like before. And this was actually uh, the first uh, case that uh, I would like to, uh, to discuss. And this app, uh, was actually the, detected uh, by myself um, on a wind energy converter. Uh, I detected by an endoscopy, something like this. Uh, it was a little bit of, uh, let's say, oil film on the uh, on the lens of the endoscope can happen sometimes. You know, if you go with the endoscope inside the gearbox, sometimes you touch a drop of oil and you have to uh, clean it with a, a piece of rag or something under construction conditions. So I'm sorry for um, uh, for the let's say uh, limited quality of this picture. Nevertheless, um, firstly. Uh, I detected the dam bearing damage on the high speed shaft of the wind energy uh, gearbox, which was in service about 18 years. Um, and then this a uh, couple of weeks later, this bearing was replaced and uh, sent to us for further inspection. And then I could see the following. So what was, uh, uh, what was uh, what can we see here? Firstly, as I said, we have this even face, yeah, uh, the even fracture surface, which is uh, looks very different like this one. So obviously, are two different phenomena. So here, it's okay. Once we have the first crack, then obviously um, it will continue with rolling contact fatigue. Then we have multiple flaking origins, not only these two, but some uh, some further ones. And uh, then uh, here it went quite deep into the material and not the complete raceway, uh, race, um, way is utilized by the crack. Uh, actually, uh, the contact area went actually until here. Remarkable furthermore is this detail. Here we can see some deposition from the oil. Yeah? So which will show us uh, the, let's say the, the contact area firstly, but it's also important for further understanding. Yeah? So uh, two phenomena. Um, it very it looks pretty much like the first one uh, uh, did uh, lead to these failures and once these first uh, areas of spalling um, appeared, then obviously it goes further by common rolling contact fatigue propagation yeah, as the material obviously is weakened. Um, next was in this context, we detected not we, but let's say here, or the company oil check uh, detected that something was was not okay with the oil. And um, um, yeah, so basically there was some detection of mixed oil, so the contamination of uh, of the um, um, of the oil with another one. Yeah, and um, then it came to my attention that a couple of months before, yeah, almost one year they changed the oil in this gearbox. Uh, um, and so not a normal oil change where they just replaced the old oil with the new one with fresh oil. No, instead um, they went for another oil type and the new oil type yeah, was supposed to be, uh, let's say uh, to last longer yeah, and to reduce the power losses of the gearbox and therefore should uh, pay its cost um, uh, in, all, yeah, in a short period. So seems to be smart. But uh, again, we had these problems yeah, here detected that there was obviously some contamination of it. So um, what might have happened? What might have happened actually? Yeah? So if you change the oil of a gearbox, um, uh, firstly, what you have to do is you have to drain the oil, yeah, fill in some new oil, um, 
turn around the gearbox a couple of me of revolutions yeah, for for flushing everything drain the oil again um, and fill again your oil maybe do this twice especially if it's uh, if there's uh, some risk of incompatibility uh, of the oil etc but furthermore um, uh, even if you if they might have done this very properly um, this is remarkable yeah we see some deposition from the oil and with this old oil actually it was well, uh, yeah, uh, this was well known we had depositions everywhere inside the gearbox yeah on all the functions uh, on all, all the surfaces which have not been functional that which means on the faces of the bearings on the faces of the gears um uh, inside the housing everywhere yeah I would assume without having seen it inside all the piping in the oil cooler system and etc. So lots of um, there, there, there are lots of surfaces that will be covered with depositions from uh, from the old oil. And if you then add some new oil, um, which chemically reacts with the old one, then um, uh, basically, what uh, what you can expect is that the that the new oil will clean up these uh, these depositions, and then these depositions will contaminate the new uh, the, the the new oil. So just flushing it once or twice would, in such situations, not be sufficient for maintaining uh, for maintaining the uh, the uh, the clean condition of the oil. At least oil check detected that there had been some uh, some some mixing of the oil so and then in this context i would like to refer to a study by skf uh, mr roland published something on the bearing world 2020 uh, and just uh, briefly summarized he showed that just one single additive can make the difference in the oil between the uh, for, for being likely to cause white etching cracks on the test trick or not yeah, one single additive ca can make the difference. Yeah, and this was this experimental study. And accordingly, if that's shown, yeah, and this which had been quite surprising, so both oils were totally fine, uh, good base oil, uh, and just uh, and uh, yeah, and most of the additives the same. Just one single additive made the difference, and uh, the picture changed from um, yeah, four bearings, four suspensions to four bearings, four failures. So dramatically um, changed. Yeah, one single additive. This means obviously, if this is true, um, a slight contamination, a slight contamination of a lubricant with another one can actually be um the problem yeah can uh, can lead to some uh, to something similar and um without jumping to conclusion um contamination might be an issue but <clears throat> at least what we saw is that um uh, that the oil in the condition as it was on the turbine um was not good, yeah, was poisonous to the bearing and therefore caused white etching cracks. And if, and if we have an 18 years old gearbox um, uh, and nothing else changed, yeah, we can be pretty uh, pretty sure that uh, the, uh, the oil change was, uh, was the root cause. While just from these observations, we will not be sure 100% whether it has something to do with the contamination or whether the oil itself was not okay from the very beginning. Yeah? But this is something um, to be further analyzed, to be further discussed. Yeah? And then um, just recently, so the first uh, case with the gearbox at, um, uh, yeah, for, uh, on the wind energy tur uh, turbine, um, this was in 2000. 20 actually, yeah. When I, when I, when I found it yeah, in 2019, they changed the oil, and recently, last December, yeah, I went to a, to a, to a factory. Yeah, yeah, I can, I must not tell the details where they changed in their in lots of their production lines. They changed the oil um, to the same product, uh, to, to the same, um, yeah, to the same new oil that, um, was associated to the case on, in the wind energy, uh, energy converters. Yeah? And, uh, so I went there for gearbox inspection on a regular basis and I got the wear and source pictures like this firstly. And I said, wait a second, this is not, uh, this is not end of life of the bearing because again, we have the same, um, uh, we have this, the same pattern, multiple origins, the cracks 
yeah, sometimes wider, sometimes smaller. So this is untypical for rolling contact fatigue. And if you would take a closer look, you can even see that we have two kinds of patterns. Some, some of the, these areas look pretty much like brittle failure. And we also see these depositions here. Yeah. And so they changed to the, to, to the oil IS before. And then later on, we conducted material analysis and we saw this one. And another one. Yeah, different gearbox, different kind of bearing, and a third one. Yeah, so here, uh, just a small finding in this case, yeah, because of the pr uh, propagation. So all the effect material was already, uh, uh, yeah, is already lost. Yeah, and uh, in this context, we have to be aware that detecting white etching cracks or white etching areas is always somehow a matter of fortune because um, they're not evenly distributed. Yeah, they don't follow any rules. Yeah, and this uh, and what we make a uh, uh, we make a cut for inspection, uh, and um, uh, uh, it's just a, it's a matter of fortune whether we touch some of this, uh, some of the affected areas, some of the, some white etching areas or not, depending on how many of them and how large of them do really exist. Yeah, and certainly if we have the propagation of of damage, then it can also happen that. Um, um, the affected material is already lost. Yeah? And the difficulty is uh, for inspection in this context is we certainly or normally um, do this, uh, uh, the, the sampling um, where we assume the first or the very beginning of the damage. So, uh, and, and therefore uh, in this position, we basically have the highest propagation. So the um, uh, maximum amount of lost material, because yeah, if we do the inspection, let's say here, um, this might be related to this problem that, that caused the damage here yeah, on the other part, but it can also be a, a secondary damage. So there's a little bit of, of trade-off between these um, two, uh, two methods. So um, for concluding, for, uh, for summarizing this, um, uh, this, this story. So first of all, we, we all know white etching cracks to frequently appear in context of frequency converters, but not limited to. Um, um, we, can, we know that in some cases, the oil actually is a problem and frequency converters or electricity um, have nothing to do uh, with it. Um, uh, we can detect white etching cracks by metallography, yeah, but sometimes uh, the vis visual inspection does already give us some clear indication. Yeah, and, uh, the conclusion from this case study actually is, yeah, so some oils can be risky, either the oil itself or the combination of some, uh, some contaminants or some, some old oil, some residuals, which is not absolutely clear, not absolutely sure, um, needs to be further, uh, further investigated. But the lesson learned and so far, and this is um, why I would like to share this with you, is um, changing the oil type in an old gearbox is like replanting a 200 years old tree or, or is like telling your grandparents to relocate in another city. Can make sense, it can go well, but not necessarily. Yeah, it can be a very uh, it can be a very bad idea, and I think that there's much more to to lose than to win. It's a different story whether if you buy a new gearbox with a new oil, that's that's fine. But if you have a system that run well, uh, did run well for ten years or twenty years or something, don't change anything. Yeah, keep it as it is. Um, you can rely on it. Yeah, obviously, if, if there would be some flaw of this, some uh, of uh, in your gearbox, in your, in your complete technical system, it would impossibly have survived for for a decade in operation. Yeah? So what can you win? You can only lose. Yeah, um, yeah. can go well sometimes, but uh, but not necessarily. Yeah? And uh, with that much, uh, I would like to thank you very much. Yeah, for for attending, and certainly um, I will be available. For your questions uh, and so if you want would like to, to send me an email on that later on um, i would be very pleased to answer them thanks again have a good one everyone and i'm looking forward to being in touch